Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do
So it is not the bite which transmits the metacyclic trypomastigotes. The bite is itchy. And of course, you scratch yourself. And while you scratch your skin, the puncture site as well as the microabrasions from your um, scratching would actually enable the metacyclic trypomastigotes from the poop to go into your broken skin. And that is how the metacyclic trypomastigote from the poop of your assassin bug will be able to penetrate through your skin layer. So it is not the bite, it is the poop, but the bite helps in letting the poop enter. I mean, letting the metacyclic trypomastigote enter into your bloodstream. Okay, since they are termed intracellular parasites, they would um, invade muscle cells, they would invade red blood cells, basically any tissue that they can come in contact with as they go around the rest of the body. Once inside tissues, they would become intracellular amastigotes, meaning they would shed off their uh, flagellum. Inside cells, they would undergo binary fission to multiply. Some intracellular amastigotes would develop into blood trypomastigotes, and they would burst out of the cell, and they would enter and swim into the bloodstream, where they will be picked up by another triatoma bug, from another blood meal. And inside the vector, we all know that they would undergo several stages of development, including epimastigotes. And we mentioned that they do not migrate to the foregut. They'd rather stay in the hindgut to develop into infective metacyclic trypomastigotes. The acute phase of Chagas disease infection is um, characterized by an initial small forunculoid lesion at the bite site. And this is called your chagoma over here. Let me shift to a laser pointer. This is a chagoma. You develop fever and lymphadenopathy. Sometimes people don't really um, notice it. But this particular sign is very distinct with Chagas disease and it's called Romanias or Romanas sign and this is due to the conjunctival point of entry of your trypomastigote. This, is, this occurs when your, uh, when your vector bites you near the eye. This particular sign is painless however it can persist for up to two months. After the acute phase, now we go to the intermediate phase. During this phase, this phase is very important because the patient is serologically positive for the infection. However, there are usually no obvious signs or symptoms associated with the infection. The intermediate phase is usually an incidental finding during blood screenings, during job, um, physical, and laboratory examinations. So it's an incidental finding. You don't normally see anything during the intermediate phase. Please take note that two-thirds of intermediate phase cases would remain on the intermediate phase throughout their lifetime. And please take note of that. While one-third of cases proceeds to the chronic phase. And the reason why a chronic phase is important is because the symptoms are very, very crucial. Symptoms are primarily due to fibrotic reactions occurring in the heart, which comprises 95% of all chronic phase, phase, chronic phase cases, the gastrointestinal tract, particularly the large intestines, and the esophagus, which accounts for around 5% of cases, and the brain, which occurs in less than 5% of cases. Now, the cardiomyopathy symptoms and pathology are very consistent with those of myocardial infarction without the actual ischemia going on. So, in fact, there are a lot of myocardial infarction cases in South America which eventually ends up being actually diagnosed as chronic Chagas disease. The right ventricle is most commonly affected in this case, which eventually leads to right-sided heart failure. Um, arrhythmias also occur, 
right? Ventricular aneurysms occur very, very similar to symptoms of myocardial infarction. Due to the marked fibrotic reactions occurring um, in chronic Chagas disease, what you get are actually signs of megaesophagus, megacolon, and in the heart, cardiomegaly. Now let's try to discuss the pathophysiology of the chronic disease. The first theory of pathophysiology is infection-induced autoimmune disease. Infection-induced autoimmune disease is characterized by chronic disease which manifests with fewer parasites. And theory number one is highlighted by uh, a, an event called molecular mimicry. Now theory number two, on the other hand, is explained by the parasite persistence. And some scientists theorize that chronic infection with parasite persistence in the body leads to chronic inflammation. And this is the, the simpler model for pathophysiology. Another concept in the discussion in the pathophysiology of chronic Chagas disease is the minimal rejection unit. A minimal rejection unit is due to the destruction of target heart cells by immune effector lymphocytes. What happens there is that you have infection of the cardiac muscles and also smooth muscles of the esophagus and the colon. Then you have inflammatory infiltrates which target the surrounding cells of the infected uh, tissues, which eventually leads to chronic fibrosis. Now fibrosis is just one, uh, one event which explains chronic Chagas disease. You also have the surrounding parasympathetic neurons being affected by the infection as well as the inflammatory reactions. This progresses to neuritis and neuronal loss. So you have a functional loss due to fibrosis and signal loss due to neuronal loss and neuritis. In diagnosing Chagas disease, you still would want to directly visualize um, your trypomastigotes. This is an example of a trypomastigote. This slide here shows you how a metacyclic trypomastigote moves or behaves in blood. So they actually move very rapidly. They dart back and forth and they wriggle about. Indirect tests in the diagnosis can also be done, and this can be in the form of immunologic tests such as ELISA and immune fluorescent, uh, immunofluorescence assays. You can do hemoculture, and you can use CNO diagnosis, which some people actually do. What they do here is that they get clean or uninfected triatomas, then they intentionally let those um, bugs feed on a suspect patient and they would um, dissect the bug and look at the intestinal contents. If they find trypomastigotes there, then the patient is probably infected. So abdominal x-rays can show you a megacolon. Chest x-rays can show cardiomegaly. And esophageal imaging will show a megaesophagus. We mentioned earlier that ECG findings, signs and symptoms, and even lab tests for chronic Chagas disease of the heart is very, very similar to what you'll find in myocardial infarction. This is an example of a biopsy, a heart biopsy showing a nest of amastigotes inside the cells of the heart. All those dots here are individual amastigotes and all of them are actually colonizing the heart muscle. The treatment for Chagas disease involves drugs which probably most of you haven't heard of. You have your nifurtimox and benzinidazole. They are used in both the acute and early chronic phase. However, in the chronic chronic phase, wherein you have the development already of fibrosis, of course, all these drugs are not effective anymore. 
The treatment for chronic Chagas disease would have to be symptomatic. You treat the cardiac symptoms for cardiopathy using cardio drugs, allopurinol, itraconazole, you give antiarrhythmics, you can give diuretics if the patient already has chronic heart failure, uh, congestive heart failure. You can also give pacemakers if you have arrhythmias already occurring. All these are symptomatic in nature. They can halt the progression, but they, but the, all these do not cure the disease. Eventually, your patient would have to need a heart transplant. Of course, for megacolon, megaesophagus, surgery would have to uh, be done. You have treatment for achalasia. You can do bowel loop interposition for late stages wherein you get a healthy bowel and you substitute it for the diseased megaesophagus. For megacolon, you give laxatives for the constipation that your patient will be, in, um, will be having. And you can take out the diseased part of the colon using end-to-end -end anastomosis. And I'll leave that to your surgery professors to discuss in more detail. For the prevention and control of Chagas disease, we mentioned earlier that blood transfusion, transfusion is still an important route of entry for the disease. Therefore, screening is considered mandatory for trypanosoma cruzi infections, particularly in endemic countries. And as with all the blood flagellates, which are vector-borne diseases, vector control is still an important package in terms of preventing and controlling the disease. Since the vector resides in poorly constructed housing, such as adobe wall, thatch roof, the bahay kubos, the, the wooden walls and floors, Substitution of these materials with plaster walls or metal roofings can help in controlling the vector. And of course, in South America, due to the burden of the disease there, education is also very important. And as early as primary education, they're trying to introduce the disease already to young kids. And that ends the third leg of blood flagellates particularly for Chagas disease or South American trypanosomiasis. I hope you enjoy the lectures. I hope you learned a lot. And I'll see you again in the next installment. Peace out.